You know about AF, it's an irregular erratic contraction of the atria leading to tachycardia, uncontrolled tachycardia, sometimes heart failure. Uh, we see more heart failure, stroke physicians see more stroke as a consequence of AF and a very, very important condition as, as you all know and a lot of time is spent on it. So I can talk about AF ablation for a week and we go to these four or five day uh, meetings on AF ablation but we've been, I've been asked uh, to focus on these three topics today. So pulmonary vein isolation which is AF ablation, uh, the um, uh, integration of images, so CT usually and, and MR image integration uh, into the ablation procedure and also follow up. So, what do we do with these patients once we've uh, once they've had their procedure? So, I recommend this. I'll show you this reference at the end. It's a it's a consensus statement on AF ablation, and out of there comes this excellent diagram. Um, if you look at C, I'd, I'd say I'd put that one first as a mechanism of atrial fibrillation. The pulmonary veins are clearly uh, and have been long uh, understood to to to, to be the the primary um, uh, mechanism for atrial fibrillation, triggering an atrial fibrillation uh, driving and maintenance. And you see those red stars, let's see if I can use this here, so these red uh, stars in the pulmonary veins, this is a posterior view of the left atrium with pulmonary veins, uh, right atrium over here, SVC, IVC. So these focal triggers and drivers of atrial fibrillation, 95% of them or more originate in the pulmonary veins and that's why we focus on that region as a, uh, as a target of ablation. And in the green, the green stars you see um, uh, you see other, other focal triggers and we'll, we'll always ta uh, tr uh, target these with ablation as well if we are able to induce them or if we find them. Sometimes you don't find them until you've completed an AF ablation and the patient no longer gets AF but gets a focal atrial tachycardia from the posterior wall, the appendage, the right atrium, SVC, uh, crystal terminalis, sometimes from the CS. The coronary sinus has muscular connections with the left atrium, some of which have electrical, independent electrical activity and can trigger atrial fibrillation as well. The second important mechanism I'd, I'd say is B. So you see macro and micro re-entrant wavelets, uh, uh, signals that collide and degenerate into, into this disorganized thing that is atrial fibrillation. Uh, we know about the autonomic ganglia and we know about um, uh, the importance of uh, and the modulation of the autonomic nervous system on the heart. And there are some, some select areas in the back of the left, at or around the left atrium uh, where these have inputs. And we, we do target these if we can. Um, Yesterday morning I did a procedure and the patient had a 15 second pause during the ablation from uh, around the left upper vein and it's usually a vagal response and it's, it's, we get a bit uh, uncomfortable with it for a little while but, uh, but it is actually a very, it's actually a, a marker of uh, success. We know that we've affected that region and we believe it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the AF ablation procedure as a whole. Now in reality D is actually usually the case, it's a, it's a bit of a mess of, um, of mechanisms there and uh, what, we do, what we do know though is that the pulmonary veins are key. So then when you look at what we do with AF ablation you'll, you'll see, if we superimpose that, you'll see that the standard uh, circumferential uh, wide area and circling of the ipsilateral pulmonary veins will, will, will affect or take out much of that, uh, much of those mechanisms. Um, we can then uh, pro uh, progress and become more aggressive with ablation by creating lines, for example, left atrial uh, roof line, a mitral line, an anterior line, a cavi tricuspid, the mouse disappears, sorry, the cavi tricuspid isthmus line. So this is, um, if we get a typical atrial flutter at any, any time during the ablation or previously, we would uh, finish the procedure with a, a right atrial cavi tricuspid isthmus typical flutter line. Uh, we see we can perform ablation to isolate the SVC. Sometimes the superior vena cava can drive AF, um, the coronary sinus and a number of other areas. And this CFE means complex fractionated electrograms. They're areas that probably, probably relate to some or more or some combination of all these mechanisms at specific sites. And that was once uh, very, uh, uh, you know, on, in vogue, but it's uh, not as commonly performed these days. So the goals are put in bold, the, really the electrical isolation of the veins and ablation around the pulmonary veins really is uh, very, it's critical to any ablation procedure for atrial fibrillation. You've probably seen this before, it's courtesy of Google, it's just about in every presentation that you'll, you'll see on atrial fibrillation, no one knows where it's from, but it's a very nice little cartoon of, of the pulmonary vein activity connect, uh, uh, being conducted into the left atrium and triggering AF. If we then ablate, which are those red circles, then we, we block that activity. So we disconnect electrically the pulmonary veins from the heart. 
Uh, the circular mapping catheter here uh, records activity in the vein, and then we have various other catheters that record activity in the atrium, and we'd like to see these to be dissociated. So this concept of exit block, so activity in the veins not being conducted into the atrium, and, and the other way around, entrance block, so a, a sinus rhythm or atrial activity not being conducted into the vein, and that's our uh, goal, Al along with the other two things you see there. So how do we do this? Um, Many techniques have evolved. The mainstay of, or the, 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 the primary and commonest way to perform this procedure worldwide and has been now for you know, 20 years plus is with a single catheter. This, this is just one example here. It's deflectible. It has a metal tip. Energy is delivered from that to, the, uh, to a back patch, uh, creating local heat and scar tissue formation. So that's essentially what ablation is at, at key sites. And then we can plot them on a, on a 3D image and we can see where we've done the ablation. Um, more recently, the balloon technologies as a one hit, so to speak, approach. And I'll show you a little video of that cryoablation balloon. I'm sure you've all heard of, very becoming much uh, more and more popular. I generally perform about 50 50 uh, in terms of percent procedures, freezing versus heating. And patients will read about one or the other and sometimes ask for one. But in general, the results are very similar. And you might have heard about the fire and ice trial just recently published in the uh, New England Journal. You can use laser, that's uh, not, not commonly done, highly focused ultrasound, various other energy modalities, but essentially these are the two dominant ones. And there are other tools, and there are, I think you'll hear about the surgical approach uh, later on, so I won't go into that. But let me just quickly take you through this video so you understand what, how, we, um, how we tackle the procedure. So we approach from the... Um, I don't know if you can mute that, because uh, I can't shout over the... Is if you could possibly mute that. So we approach from the right femoral vein usually with a sheath up to the right atrium crossing and you've seen all the anatomy from the right atrium through into the left atrium with a needle and then pass a sheath through and that's the, so the transseptal puncture. Um, and then you'll see it's playing very slowly which is good so I won't pause it, I'll just <laughs> talk through it. So this, we reach the left atrium and then we either, this is about cryoablation but it's a nice little video with showing you this, the relative structures and the anatomy. We reach these pulmonary veins, you can see these uh, lightning bolts, that's the electrical activity emerging from the pulmonary veins and uh, we'll, you'll, you'll see struggling a bit, isn't it? Uh, eventually, <laughs> we'll, you'll, you'll see a, a circular mapping catheter going into the pulmonary veins, mapping that activity, and then the balloon inflates, um, and then, uh, I'll just see if I can fast forward it a bit, but yeah, sorry about this. You played very fast out there. You've probably heard that before. It worked really well in the control room there, um, but when you play it, and play it live, and particularly if this is being streamed to other sites, it always creates a bit of anxiety. So this thing will eventually eventually come out. Let's just see if we can speed it up a bit. Um, the balloon plugs the vein. And delivers energy, freezing energy uh, to to that region. You can see that it is a very nice video. It was. <laughs> Let's just get get to the end there. You can see the temperature drops. Where the balloon has uh, contact with the pulmonary veins is where the energy is uh, delivered. And oh, have I? Yes, I know my phone's gone to sleep as well. So let's just make some, <laughs> make some meaningless chit chat. Um, well, eight, uh, I'm up to eight minutes and it's slide seven, so I'm going by uh, <laughs> one slide per minute. Let's um, let's carry on. So so freezing is delivered to the areas where the balloon contacts the atrium and then creates uh, electrical disconnection. It's a shame it's not playing very well. You can see me afterwards. I'll play it on my phone faster than this. All right. I'll let it finish because then it, it shows you the... Oh, let's move on. All right, so then... Yes, this is the next slide. So now the, the, the goal, what that would have shown you was that the electrical uh, signals are no longer emerging from the pulmonary veins, the signals are no longer present, and then we move to the left lower vein, the, left, uh, the right lower vein and the right upper vein, and we can talk about technicalities a bit later on over morning tea. Very happy to go into more detail. So that, that's, that's the freezing or cryoablation approach. The RF ablation will usually involve um, uh, image integration, which is what we'll talk about next. So generally we use CT just because it's so available. It's... Uh, I think a bit cheaper than MRI, uh, but much faster. And the downside is that it, it does involve some, some radiation. However, having said that, the current uh, technology is so good and the resolution is so high that we, we have, and the gating is so good that we have really minimal um, radiation exposure for the patient for these procedures. 
Um, terminology, well, you've, you've heard of St. Jude Medical and Navix and Biosense Webster and Carto. They're the two dominant uh, technologies around the world. Uh, Bios, uh, Boston Scientific has just released uh, their Rhythmia system, which is excellent, but um, it's uh, really only available in one or two sites in Australia at the moment. We can integrate uh, da uh, ultrasound data, so so-called Carto sound from ice, which is intracardiac echo during the procedure. And then we, the final thing I'll show you is uh, image integration uh, on the table with uh, with fluoroscopy there. So. Uh, just some pictures here. So this is an older Carto. It's one of the earlier versions on the, on the left. Um, you can see that it's, it's, it's a very rudimentary left atrial-like representation. It's really nothing like the image on the right, which is the CT data. So we used to we would create these images point by point. The computer would render a three-dimensional structure. We could plot where we've done ablation. We've got these stylized uh, pulmonary veins there, but then. It's, if you compare that to the actual, using the actual CT data, you'll see the, the, the difference. It's pretty clear. It's the same with, uh, this is a more modern version. So you can sometimes just do a very crude or b more basic uh, map on the table, integrate it with the blue, which is the CT data, and end up with a very uh, sophisticated looking image. And just so I've shown both dominant companies, not to show preference for one over the other. This is Navix, and in fact, the current versions of, of, of both of these are, are so good that the, it, it almost is a lifelike representation, even without the CT scan. So we'll touch on that in a minute. Um, now, these, the, the downside of these two systems, they do take a bit of time, but cost is the main problem, and it's a, if it's a, it's a worldwide problem. It's a, uh, a limiting factor in our in, in, and, and frustration for many of us. So there are other ways, for example, doing a rotational CT angiogram uh, on the table of the left atrium. So you see the, the uh, you do a, a left atrial injection, a very rapid acquisition, and then that's then uh, overlaid with the CT data, the 3D model of the left atrium th that's, that was taken earlier. And then that's then linked to, the, to that patient, to that table, the camera can move, the table can move, and then the, that structure will spin around and guide you without having to go through the, um, uh, the, the, the 3D mapping uh, per se. So what are the benefits? Well, you've heard about unusual an anatomies, anomalies. We've detected various things with, with previous CT. The, I've, once or twice a year, maybe I'll do an ablation procedure without CT. The CT doesn't work, or there was no time, or it's a more urgent procedure, or whatever. And the, one of those times a year was the, was the time we found one of these uh, sinus venosus ASDs. The wires were going in strange places. We had to stop the procedure and, and get a CT and an MRI, ultimately an MRI and then uh, rethink the whole procedure. So it is very much worthwhile and we all want to know the anatomy before we embark on these invasive procedures. Not just for, uh, not just for AF ablation, but, but you'll hear about left atrial appendage occlusion, mitral clips, all sorts of other possible applica uh, applications. It, does, it, there is, it detects very, very fine structures and with very high resolution, and it's the most realistic uh, representation of the anatomy. And there are publications showing safety, uh, showing reduced procedural, uh, reduced ablation time because you know exactly where you are. Uh, you, you can uh, integrate the, the, the procedures a lot more accurately and then possibly even reduce uh, radiation exposure uh, in so doing. You heard about anatomy, but... Um, Let's, I'll just show you the, more specifically the pulmonary vein anatomy. This is from uh, a publication from some time ago, but you can see the, the multiple variations of the right uh, pulmonary veins, the commonest being a right middle vein, and that can come independently off, off one of the other branches. On the left, the commonest is a left common pulmonary vein, so the left upper and lower joining to form one larger vein. And this can, can, actually, be, can actually make the procedure easier or can make the procedure harder, but it really is important to know what you're dealing with beforehand. And there are these, these other unusual things that you won't find. I've had one of these patients where the catheter, and it's very disconcerting when you see on x-ray your, your, your catheter go straight through the roof of the, of the left atrium and you, it makes you very uncomfortable and very worried. And then you're checking the blood pressure and all this. And then you realize that, yes, it's, that patient uh, has a left atrial roof vein. And I've had one of those where I've detected it in that way. And we've had, I've got a couple of CTs, just not as good as this one, uh, showing, uh, and not as large as this one, these left atrial roof veins. There are also pouches as well. They're, they're rudimentary or primordial pulmonary veins. They're different to pul pulmonary veins. They, uh, they're usually frail, the thin walled, small, and you don't want to be putting your catheter too close to there or ablating in there. 
uh, because serious complications can ensue. Um, they do, there are case reports of uh, arrhythmogenic roof veins, and then they do need to be encircled with ablation, but by and large, we will stay away from them. So for every, every positive study showing the benefits of image integration, well, I mean, there, this is a, a randomized uh, study looking at whether or not having a CT beforehand um, uh, makes any significant difference to their outcomes. And they didn't find, in terms of AF recurrence, they didn't find any significant uh, benefit there. Doesn't stop us from doing it. So finally, then, the third part of this presentation, and we're running on time, is the follow-up and what we do with these patients after ablation and how we follow them up and in what way. So I've divided that into, th into three, uh, three ways, I suppose, clinical review. And really, that's, that's the key. The, the, the reason we do these AF ablation procedures, they're complex, they're, they're risky procedures. We do them to make the patients feel better. We don't do them to reduce the risk of stroke. We don't do them to stop anticoagulation. We don't do them to make people live longer. We, make, we do them to make people feel better. So the most important thing about follow-up is, is, is symptoms and how does the patient feel? Has, are they having less AF? Are they having any AF? Uh, are they able to do things they weren't before? And that's what we like to, uh, what we like to hear, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, I call this snapshot monitoring a random ECG or random 24-hour monitor is of questionable benefit, but you know, in the purposes of, of strict follow-up or clinical trials, that has to be, um, that has to be considered. And then continuous monitoring, I notice Alicia's here from Medtronic and she can take you through the loop recorders. I've been giving you a loop single, so <laughs> this is my last st uh, slide. We have um, procedural success, I'll leave it up there so you can read, is pulmonary vein isolation at the time. Clinical success or partial, with like a 75% reduction in, in duration, number or burden of AF. We ignore the first three months, and I'll explain that in the break, uh, because of inflammation and other, other factors. So one year success is no AF, for uh, off anti drugs drugs uh, between that three and 12 month mark. And recurrence is defined at thir as, as 30 seconds. Now, what does 30 seconds of AF or you know, two minutes of AF during sleep mean on a random halter? It means nothing clinically. So I'll, I'll put that to you that it's not a, that it's not, that it's not a failed ablation. I think Michael Yee's got a, a pet hate for this sort of definition as well. He'll talk to you about that from the surgical side. Um, and then I recommend this, uh, this uh, consensus statement. It's involved all the arrhythmia bodies around the world. All right. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the invitation.